Dear God, we come to you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, just your, your great love for us, Father. We thank you for how amazing you are, for how um, powerful you are, for how loving and graceful you are. Um, Father God, especially to um, sinners like us, God, we, we know that we are not perfect. We admit that. Um, <coughs> God, that's why we're so grateful for, for your love. We're so thankful for um, the, the, the life of Jesus. Especially, especially though, this time of year, um, honestly, it really shouldn't just be this time of year. Should it? We should always be grateful for what Jesus did on the cross for us. Um, it's what truly um, makes um, Christianity worthwhile. And so, God, we're, we're thankful for all that you do for us. We're thankful for how much you love us. We're thankful, <laughs> Father, for your word, uh, for even stories like Jonah, which seem silly and seem kind of trivial at points. Uh, Father God, there's a lot of meaning to them. So I pray, Father, that you would fill this room right here, right now, um, that you would empty out everything that Satan is going to throw our way to try to distract us from hearing from you. I pray that you would empty me of me, uh, fill me as your vessel to deliver your message. Um, and God, open our ears to hear you, our minds to understand your word, and soften our hearts, Father God, so we can receive your message and put it into practice starting tonight. Uh, let's bless this time now. Use it for your kingdom, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are in the book. We are in the book of Jonah. Okay, last week we read chapter 1. Okay, and I got a little bit of review here. Okay, last week we read chapter 1 together, the longest chapter of the four. So pretty simple, pretty easy. But here's the lessons that we pulled away from last week. If you weren't able to be here or just to, to refresh you, okay, the three things we pulled away from chapter 1 of Jonah is that we have to rethink our idea of God's commandments. And I wish I would have honestly touched on this on Sunday when I was preaching, because what I said on Sunday has a lot to do with this as well. Today's church, today's people, tend to look at God's commandments as suggestions. Okay, The church tends to look at God's commandments and his instructions as, you know, well, if you feel like it, if, if I want to, I will follow that. And that's not what God, how God intended it, is it? Okay. God's commandments, his instructions, his messages through his people, through this word, says this is how you have the best life possible. This is how you have everything that I want to give you, is by following the instructions in this book. And when you even go off kilter on one of those, you're going to miss the mark. You're going to miss the best. And so it's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm still okay if I'm, if I'm getting good. But why would you settle for good when you can have the best? Okay. And that's exactly what we do. We settle. We settle with God because we just look at his commandments. We look at this book and go, well, they just kind of, they're, they're just there to help us. But they're commandments. They're instructions from God. Okay, if you, don't, if, you, if you go to class and your teacher says, hey, here's the instructions for this assignment, and you go, well, those are just suggestions, you're going to fail that assignment. Okay? And many of us are failing the assignment of God. Because we look at his commandments as just suggestions. We need to rethink everything about God's word and make sure that, hey, his commandments are, are, are important, are extremely vitally important. The second thing we looked at, we can be assured that if God has called us in any kind of mission, any kind of mission, small, medium, large, whatever it is, he will be with us every step of the way. We sometimes we tend to think, okay, God's asking me to do something, maybe stand out at school, maybe say a prayer at lunch table at school, carry my Bible at school. Um, I, and I get, I'm just too nervous. I'm too scared. But God's right there with you. He's going to help you. He's going to do it. He's going to be there with you every single step of the way if He's telling you to do it. And then that last thing we looked at is disobedience is costly. It's costly to us. It's costly to the people around us. It's costly to the people that we care about. It's not just us. It's costly <coughs> when we disobey God's word, as we looked at in Jonah chapter one, when Jonah disobeyed God, and he went the opposite direction of what God told him to do. And it almost put the lives of the entire ship. Everybody was on that boat with him. It put their lives in jeopardy. So it wasn't just Jonah. It was everybody who was there with him. But their life was literally in danger because he was disobedient to God. Okay? And so in chapter 1, we ended last week with... Um, they knew it was Jonah. Jonah admitted it, that he had done wrong. God was punishing him. They threw him overboard into the water. The storm stops immediately. Storm stops immediately. And everybody goes, one of the greatest things about that is 
everybody on that boat who had probably never heard about God before, the God, our God, they looked at me, hey, the God of Jonah is the real God. Right? Everyone on that boat admitted it at that point. So there was some good that came of that. Right? But it's really not the best way to do it. So, But at the end of chapter 1, Jonah is thrown overboard. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and Jonah is swallowed by the fish. We don't know if it was a whale. We don't know if it was, you know, like a big shark. We All we know is it just says it was a fish. Uh, a, a great fish swallowed Jonah. More than, likely, more than likely, it probably was some form of a whale because it has to obviously be large to fit a human being, to swallow a human being whole and to hold a human being. Okay? And so the end of chapter 1, it says, Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. And that's where we picked up chapter 2. So we're going to read chapter 2. I'm going to read it for you. Okay, and then we're going to talk real quick about it. So follow, listen along. This is Jonah. Jonah's been in there for three days now. Catch it, okay? Three days, 72 hours, he's been inside of this fish. But who knows what else in there, okay? I'll be willing to bet that Jonah wasn't the only thing inside the belly of this fish. This fish hadn't been eaten before. So can you imagine, I mean, if y'all have ever been around fish, <laughs> dead fish, is it pleasant? The smell is horrid, okay? So he's probably sitting there next to some half, three-quarters digested fish, all kinds of other things from the sea. The smell is disgusting. It's been three full days. And finally, here's the key. Finally, after three days, don't know what Jonah was waiting on. Maybe he was saying, God's going to punish me. I didn't do what he wanted me to do. So I'm in the belly of this fish, and I'm just going to slowly be digested by this fish, and I'm going to die. And maybe after three days, he goes, okay, well, maybe not. But three days, he was there. And then he says this. This is his prayer. Listen, he says, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. He says, I cried out to the Lord. I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. Great lesson right there alone. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths. I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waves and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. Seaweed's not fun at all, especially when it's wrapped around you. Right? It says, I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates lock shut forever. But you, O oh Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all of God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. And I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. And after that prayer, says the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach, where he was supposed to have been all along. Okay, so what we have here, guys, what we have is we have a poem that Jonah basically recited as kind of a prayer, as a song. Okay? And if you don't know much about poetry, poetry is one of those things, you don't just make up poetry, not good poetry. Okay? Poetry is one of those things, it's like a song, it comes from the heart. It comes from it comes from the best of times, it comes from the worst of times in life. And Jonah right here, he was struggling. He was he was at the end of what he thought of everything. And so this is a poem that he kind of wrote that he said, as he's thinking, hey, this is this might be it for me. This might be it. He says, Hey, you know what? I'm still, I'm still gonna cry out. To the Lord. Um, so, I'm not sure what Jonah was thinking waiting 72 hours before he finally says, okay, you know what, maybe God's not done with me yet. But it took him 72 hours to come to this realization, and then he cried out to the Lord. Right? You can learn from that. We're going to talk about that here in a second. When we walk away from God, y'all, when we walk away, we often find ourselves in a meta metaphorical belly of the fish. We find ourselves... In a place that we don't want to be. We find our place in the depths. Okay, Jonah was not just in the belly of a whale. 
But where do whales go? Do they always stay at the top of the water? Most of the time, they're way down. So not only is Joey in the belly of a whale, but Joey's in the belly of a, of a fish, sorry. It's probably hundreds of feet deep in the water. Okay, Cold, dark, stinky, couldn't really get much worse. Couldn't get much worse. And for three days, he sat there in this going, what is God going to do with me? Instead of asking God from the very beginning, okay, God, what should I do now? He waited three days. He waited three days. And finally, he cries out to the God, and, and God orders the, the fish to come to the surface and spit Jonah out onto the dry ground. Okay? So what we have is we have a poem of distress, a poem of Jonah crying out because he has no idea what else to do because he has hit the rock bottom of rock bottom of rock bottoms. Okay? Metaphorically, we can get that way sometimes too, but we continue to do things our way instead of God's way. So what do we learn from this? What, what are we going to take some notes on here tonight? Here we go. Okay? Number one, when we mess up, when we walk away like Jonah did, when we sin, great, God's greatest desire is to restore the relationship between us and him. Think about that. God's greatest desire, the thing that he wants most is to be restored, for our relationship with him to be completely restored. Even though we're the ones that messed up, we're the ones that turn our back on him, we're the ones that walk away, God still wants restoration. God still wants us to be close. Okay? If you've got a friend who does something to you, and they really hurt you, they turn their back on you, and, and, and they just leave you leave you out to dry. Do you immediately want restoration? No. You don't. It hurts. Yeah. So you want to kind of dwell on that for a little while. You, you don't want you want them to seek you out for restoration. But God says, Hey, you messed up, you sinned against me. I'm still pursuing you. I'm still coming after you because I want to restore our relationship together. Um but guys, let's not be like Jonah. Let's not wait until we're literally miserable, absolutely at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, before we realize this. The moment we sin, the Holy Spirit is in us. That should convict us. And we should turn right around to God and say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for that. Let's rebuild this relationship. But he wants to always restore the relationship that we have with him. And number, number two thing that we can learn from this is there's zero limits, absolutely no limits to God's love and to God's forgiveness. Think about that. There are no limits. God did his part. He sent Jesus to die. We're going to celebrate that here in just a couple of weeks. He sent Jesus to die for our sins. All we have to do is confess. All we have to do is say, God, I know I did wrong. Will you forgive me and will you help me? Will we restore that relationship. All right, there's no limits to his love and to his forgiveness. Ultimately, what does this mean for me and for you? What do we learn from this very short chapter, this poem, song, whatever you want to call it, of Jonah? What do we learn from this? Is God knows everything about us. He knows everything. And he still loves us and desires a relationship with us. Guys, why would we wait? Why would we wait 72 hours like Jonah did in the belly of the whale until things cannot honestly get any worse? Right. Okay, exactly. That, that's that pride. That's part of it. But it's also because, let's be honest, guys, there's a lot of times we don't want restoration, do we? Because we know God's going to want us to change. We know God's going to want us to start reading our Bible and praying. We know God's going to want us to start taking church more seriously instead of playing games. We know God's going to want us to be better. And we don't want to put in that work. Oh, sure, we'll, we'll play games with God all day long. But when God says, hey, it's time to get serious, we say, nah, God, I'll wait. And God, the whole time, God said, you're going, man, I have so much good stuff for you that's just waiting. I've got these big, big plans for you, but I can't do these big plans because you won't do the small things that require me to be ready to use you for those big plans. Why wait? Why wait? 
You know, it's just, guys, it's just like, man, you get, you, you get in trouble at home from your parents because you did something that wasn't right. You did something you know goes against their, it goes against their rules, goes against their commandments, their regulations, whatever you want to call it, goes against that, right? And you're in trouble. But they say, hey, if you just do this, then we'll be okay. Are you going to go, well, you know what? No, I don't want to. I don't want my phone back. I don't want to be ungrounded. I'm just going to sit here in my belly and my whale and soup, soak and sulk and pout and throw my little pity party. No, you're going to be like, man, okay, if that's all i got to do, to be able to be forgiven, to be able to have all my, uh, you know, whatever, all my, everything restored, to have all my freedoms and, and everything restored, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it pretty quickly, Right? God is saying the exact same thing. Why wait? Why wait? Why wait to get right with God? Just because it, you know it's going to mean you're going to start changing some things, you're going to change the way that you talk to people, the way you treat people, it's going to change the way that you um, think about God, you think about His Word, you think about the church, it's going to lead to some changes, and you want to stay in your comfort zone, but here's the thing. Comfort zones don't ever lead to God-sized tasks. We always have to get out of our comfort zone for God to be able to stretch us and to use us. Jonah was asked to, in today's world, guys, that would be like God coming to you and to me and saying, hey, I want you to go to the Al-Qaeda camp in Afghanistan, and I want you to walk up to their front gate, and I want you to knock on it and say, hey, God loves you, you need to turn to him. Not a single person would be willing to do that because we know the moment we got within a thousand yards of that, you'd be shot and you'd be killed. Okay? We know that. But that's what God was telling Jonah to do. And here's the thing, guys. If God comes to me and God comes to you and he says, hey, I want you to go to Afghanistan and I want you to preach Jesus to the people there, you think he's just going to leave you hanging? If God specifically is the one who says you need to go, He's going to take care of you. Even in the situation that you think, I'm just walking into a death trap. That's what Jonah thought. That's why he ran. And as we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, when Jonah actually obeyed God, God did something huge. God did something that Jonah never thought was possible. God is sitting here to every single one of us in this room. He's saying, hey, I've got something that is so big, you can't even begin to imagine what I want to do with your life. Something so amazing, something so cool, something so God-sized, I want to do it in your life. But if you can't even take 20 minutes out of your day to spend time in my word and in prayer with me, how can you expect me to use you to do something big? If you think church is a chore and church is boring and church is... Not something that is worth your time. God is saying, how can I use you when you're not ready to learn about me? You're not ready to grow, really grow, and learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. This is something we should look forward to, y'all. We should look forward to getting into God's word on our own every single day. To praying to the God of the universe, our creator, our sustainer, our savior. We should look forward to that every single day. We should look forward to Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. We should look forward to that because God is present and we're ever seeking to grow closer to him. We should look forward to God saying, hey, these are, these are the bare minimum things, y'all. I can't do big things with you if we can't do the small things. So get involved in those and let God stretch you, let God grow you. And watch what he, how he blesses your life and watch what he does and how he uses you to impact the people around you, and to lead people to Jesus, which is the most important thing, most important assignment any one of us has. The best assignment we can have. The most rewarding assignment that we can have. To lead people to Jesus. And God can't do that if we're always focused on ourselves, not willing to just follow him. And he's not asking us to go to Afghanistan. He's just asking us to go to our the friends at our, at our lunch table. He's asking us to talk to people on our sports team um, or uh, in, our, in our band. He's asking us to talk to them about Jesus, to share the love of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. 
Especially this time of year when we're talking about Easter. Share it. You guys will watch what I'll do. Watch what God will do in a situation like that. And you're just willing to, to, to listen and be obedient. Right? Why wait? Come back to God. Repent tonight. Say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for treating you like you don't really matter. Let's do this. Let's go all in. And let's do something big. And he will do it if you will simply allow him to. Right? Let's pray. God, thank you again so much for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for Jonah um, and the story, Father God, that illustrates to us how amazing you are. Uh, God, how loving and graceful you are. But God, also how strong and powerful um, that you are. May we learn from that, Father God. I pray that you give us boldness. I pray that you give us confidence to go to our lost friends, to talk about Jesus, to share our faith, to invite them to come to church, especially with Easter just a couple weeks away. Give us courage to do that. And Father God, I pray that you would just begin to work in each one of us right here, right now. Um, to God, that you would transform us um, by the renewing of our mind, as Romans 12 says. Um, but God, that comes through being in your word. So help us to get into your word, to understand it, to know what it says, to know how to apply it to our lives. Um, use us, Father God, going from here to just reach this community around us with the gospel of Jesus. We love you so much. Thank you for loving us and sending Jesus to die in our place. We ask all this in his precious name. Amen.